I'd like to dedicate this to my family, they mean everything to me. Okay, this has started happening. Uh, YouTube have taken it upon themselves to start taking down videos that we make. Uh, apparently we're criminals and our videos shouldn't be out there. That is what we are listed under and that is the official, what they're saying about our videos. Some of the big hitters, people I follow on Twitter, they've been saying things like this and I fully support this. I feel like we need to stand up on this one. And this is a very, very good point. Where are they going to go to if they can't go to YouTube? Now, I'd like to say that I left school with nothing and I had no money for education and I was a bum. Oh, I can't say that word. Um, I, I, was, I, was, I had no job for years and I eventually got into IT through YouTube videos and it got me to be a network engineer, it got me to be a security engineer, it got me to be a pen tester, it got me to pass pen testing exams. Um, without YouTube, I wouldn't be here today talking to you. And I feel quite passionate about this, that our videos shouldn't be blocked, they shouldn't be banned. Um, that's, that's all I have to really say on this. I did say uh, recently on Twitter that I'll talk about this. And that's what I believe. We shouldn't be censored. Welcome to my show. Okay, December the 17th, 2015, Ukraine. 20, uh, 225,000 lights went out. Dragonfly 2.0 were held accountable for this hack, also known as Berserk Bear, a suspected Russian group. They attack Europe, but they particularly love the USA. They go for critical infrastructure. Uh, this was a piece from the New York Times, from the FBI and Homeland Security, talking about them hacking, Dragonfly hacking power stations uh, in the Uni United States. And this caught my eye. Uh, I'm always interested in the word, word documents, malicious code, clicked and steal their credentials. That in particular caught my attention. Okay, Dragonfly 2.0 are famous for using spear phishing techniques. And I know what you're going to say, I've spoken those loads and it's boring, so why bother? Well, this is the reason. They steal credentials. Now, normally, we don't hear about people stealing credentials, especially not APT groups. We hear about them getting remote shells, getting remote access. So I started to read a little bit more into this. I was interested. So I went to the Mitre, Mitre website, which can lose hours and hours and hours reading about threat groups. Uh, I really recommend people have a look. But what interested me was, I drilled down and looked at the groups who use SMB exploitation. And I absolutely love SMB. If anyone's been to any of my talks before, you'd know that I talk a lot about SMB. So what can you do with the SMB? Here's my first video. So, we have a legitimate, well, not legitimate, but someone's going to an internet site. And over here we have the uh, threat actors machine where they control the, they control the index file to the website. They drop an SMB request into the index file. And we go back to the target and they refresh their browser. And just from looking at a site with an SMB request in using Internet Explorer and weak outbound firewall rules, port 445 request is sent back to the attacker's machine. The attacker's machine has responder going and they manage to collect the username, the domain name and the password hash. We can cut crack, we can reverse that password hash. I've chatted loads and loads and loads about this. If you've got a good dictionary, you can generally do it. If you have loads of money, you can buy lots of graphic cards, you can definitely do it. If anyone's interested, that is the, what the SMB request in an image tag that's placed into an index file. So it's literally just an SMB request and when you browse to it, your, your IE will automatically make that request or trigger it. This does not work with Chrome anymore. It used to. People have said, did it work with Chrome? For years, it did work with Chrome. Uh, not Chrome, sorry. Uh, Edge. Edge. I've ruined the bit there. Uh, Microsoft Edge. It does no longer work with Edge because they've made Edge basically Chrome. So, what use are credentials? Well, I've spoken a lot about how if I get remote access into a target, I like to have credentials so I can then start to sniff around the network and I can start to prove -esque. But what's interesting was about two or three years ago, uh, SensePost released a tool called Ruler. And what Ruler allows you to do, if you're using uh, OWA, Microsoft's 
web uh, email solution and you have credentials, you can then generally, if they don't have multi-factor authentication, you can log in and read a target's emails, which is great because attackers don't want to become domain admin. They don't want things like that. They want to get people's data. If you have Office 365, you can also get hold of their Word documents, their Excel documents, uh, SharePoint, you can get access to everything and read about an organization. You have 100% compromised and just from stealing credentials alone. But what Rule is really interesting is, Rule allowed you to, via OWA, uh, create and upload a reverse shell to the target's machine for the credentials you own and trigger it on command. So you can trigger that shell anytime you like. So just from credentials alone, you are now capable of getting actually a reverse shell as well under the right circumstances. Also, there is you could use SSL, VPN, and other solutions like Citrix to get access to the credentials. So credentials are very important. Now, what's interesting is APT groups are starting to get used to this and starting to sort of hear about it and starting to use it. So APT 34 and 33 have been heard to be using Ruler and stealing credentials. So 2019, and we're still honing with just SMB alone, which is not something I thought I would be saying. Now, this brings me to this point. People are always saying, especially red teaming, I do a lot of red teaming, and people will always say, well, targets are really mature. So let's have a think about this. Uh, businesses that ask for red teams, yes, they are generally financial organizations or large, large retailers, people who make vast amounts of money. They have the greatest, the best, the best toys in the world. They secure themselves, they buy the tin that helps them to be secure. They want to know that it's working. They have testing after testing after testing. So, in essence, the people we target are mature. And we will come in, we might gain access, and we'll tell them how to fix it, and then we'll go back the next year and retest them, and surprise, surprise, what we previously used the year before hopefully no longer works again. So, yes, our targets are mature. And then we have CBEST. Now, CBEST is top of the tree in the UK. It was set up by the Bank of England and Crest, and it allow, it's only for UK banks, and it allows them to verify after the CBEST test that they are up to CBEST standards. They are the most secure of the secure. Now, these are against the most mature targets in the UK you've ever come across. So you would quite expect that SMB exploitation wouldn't work against these people. Typical PowerShell exploitation wouldn't work against these people. So, yes, they're really, 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 really mature. So... This, though, is the reality. So the people that we target are incredibly mature. But this was released about I think, three or four months ago. And if you look at 2010 to 2015, minus that humongous explosion, and these are some of the largest organizations in the world that are compromised, uh, minus that explosion there, if you actually look from 2015 to 2019, I would say it's actually increasing. It's getting more. So there's more and more compromises. And even if you turn around and say there isn't, because that was a massive explosion and we haven't got this here, what you have got, you've got a continuing trend of the largest organisations out there being compromised and compromised and compromised. So, in all honesty, I think it's fair to say that while our targets are mature, the real world is not. Now, for your amusement, I will give you a live red team. Boom! Right, so leading up to a red team, as a red team operative uh, engineer, uh, it's quite nerve-wracking. It's as nerve-wracking as giving a talk. You have this expectancy placed upon you that you will compromise the targets, you will get access in. Leading up to it, you will start to have a look at the organisation you are targeting. You might start to have LinkedIn profiles where you might start to make connections and communicate with people. Uh, you might start to connect a lot of the business uh, you're also starting to think about what infrastructure to use. Now, when it actually comes to the first day of testing, well, not it is the first day of the official test, you build your infrastructure and you do reconnaissance. So the reconnaissance period is when we're looking at who we're going to target and what we're going to target. Now, at this point, you'll start to come up with your scenarios. Your scenarios are your campaigns that you're going to target against your targets. And uh, infrastructure builds as well is incredibly stressful and we spend a large proportion of our time, maybe one to three to five days at this stage, preparing. So once the campaign is actually about to go, we will generally start with a phishing campaign, um, because the reality is, while it's a red team, and we can do anything we like against the target, if we were to use other alternative methods, 
like Twitter or LinkedIn to communicate with people, it's absolutely fantastic to start to build up a rapport with a target, but the reality is if you were to send to them a weaponized document via one of these mediums, there's an incredible chance they're going to open it on their mobile phone and it's of no use to you, or they're going to open it on their own computer at home. Again, it's of no use to you, but secondly, it's out of scope. So the reality is we generally have to just target them via phishing email. Now, in the real world, an APT group wouldn't do that. They would use absolutely anything they possibly can. So here we go. We're about to send in our phishing email. We have the red team and we have Blanca. So, we are literally at that point. Now, at the point of sending a phishing email, which you cr carefully craft to either look like a spoofed internal email or alternative to look like a recruitment drive or something like that that you feel the person might click on, I'm always quite nervous. It's a buzz, but it's also quite nerve-wracking because there's a lot of expectation that you're going to do well. But let's have a look at what happens. So, boom, we send our first phishing email in. And the target takes it on the chin. They're a little bit shocked and a little bit surprised, but they come back. So what do we do? We up the game. We make a better phishing email. We make something that looks more enticing. Or we try a slightly different target in the organization. We send another email in. Boom, they accept it. They have downloaded the document. We no longer put attachments in emails. There's no point. Email gateway solutions like Mindcast will just block them. So what we do is we put a hyperlink into an email and we allow that person to download it themselves, generally bypassing the email solution. Email solutions are getting smart to this though, but it is a general technique that we use. So they've downloaded the Word document, they've opened it, we put a massive banner on it saying, you need to enable this macro to access your documents. They open it. Boom. There you go. We are now got a remote connection to them and we're on the internal network. The first thing we've done is we're looking at ways to privesk. Generally, you will look at the user credentials that you've stolen with the remote access and see if you can use those anywhere on the internal network. As it happens on this circumstance, we have managed to identify a place where that user has local administrative access on one of the machines on the internal network. So we have used that to privesk. We have laterally moved to that machine and we've gained access to it as a local administrator. We are now in control of that machine and we can dump the hashes off that box. Windows, I've said this over and over again in my talks, but I'll say it again. People generally on an internal network will build one machine and then they'll clone it over and over and over and over again. And what will happen is that local password hash, because Microsoft doesn't salt it, will be the same on every individual box. So once you've stolen it from one, you can reuse it on all the other boxes. And what makes this even sweeter is you don't need to even reverse that hash. Microsoft will accept the pure hash. So you can just pass that around the internal network and gain local administrative access to all the other machines. At that point, we're almost at the point of taking over completely. What we are doing now is we're trying to hunt out a user or users who belong to the domain administrative group. And there is the DA. And the reason why we want this is because it will give us complete access to the entire network. Uh, Microsoft domain, completely unrestricted access to the Microsoft domain. I apologize to one. I'm a little bit rusty. This is my first talk this year and it's the only talk I'm giving. Um, Boom, there you go, we've done it. We've managed to find someone with domain administrative group, uh, someone belonging to the domain administrative group. They're probably sitting on a Microsoft Exchange box, as they typically do, and we've managed to capture them and compromise them. It was a Windows Server 2008 box, so we could use Mimicats to reverse their password in clear text, and we've got their password, we've got their username, and we've got their password. We are now a domain administrator on the group, on the uh, entire internal domain. And bang, it is over. You win, perfect. So, we now have complete access to their domain and we can start to do what an attacker would possibly do and look for the sensitive data. And we're, you're normally given uh, a target or something to go for once you've got access in, get access to a SQL database, verify or prove that you could access our sensitive documents. Now, the reality is, this early stage from getting access in can take anywhere from a week to two weeks the actual attack phase from sending the email, though, a large proportion of that is reconnaissance and building your infrastructure. The actual sending the phishing email in and becoming domain admin can sometimes be as relatively short as 30 minutes. Uh, it's quite alarming, but that's how it is. So what have we learned so far? Uh, APT groups, uh, particularly in Ukraine, turn lights off, and they're dangerous. And we've also learned a bit about red teaming. Okay, if you're interested in stories with happy endings, you'd be better off hearing another talk. There are no happy beginnings and very few happy things in the middle. Scene one. I'm not going to read that out. <laughs> so, we're talking remote shells. Of course we are. I love remote access into uh, places. I had a chat with someone last night. He goes, no one cares, Neil, about shells. No one cares. Well, uh, years and years and years ago, I'm going off track here, but years and years and years ago, when I wanted to first talk, 
I was asked, what do I want to talk about? And I said, I want to talk about SMB exploitation, remote access, poning things, getting into things, exciting stuff, stuff that I want to hear about. Nah, no one wants to hear that, Neil. Well, four odd years later, I'm still here and I'm talking to people, so hopefully people do want to hear it. Uh, right, quick update. Right, advanced adversaries. Uh, an advanced persistent threat, APT, is a, t is a targeted cyber attack in which an intruder gains access to a network. Think fancy bear. And here we have a very corporate image that you'll be able to get off the internet about an APT group. Now, I don't like these diagrams. Um, I don't generally understand them. I do this as a job, and I don't fully get these. But that's maybe just me. Uh, but in, in reality, I get that bit, they use PowerShell. But apparently they somehow send an arrow to a machine. And then from that machine, they somehow do PowerShell, and they get targeted systems. Uh, right. So as red teamers or security professionals, what do we need to do? Well, we need to uh, replicate. We need to replicate the bad people. Now, this is something that I sometimes puzzle with. Um, are we replicating them, or are they replicating us? Because what you find is, people in the industry will release tools. We will use them. God, that's amazing. We will create videos. We'll talk about it at conferences. The next thing you know is the APT groups are using them. And it also brings another question. All you hear in security, or in my world, all I seem to hear is, APTs are the best of the best. They're the top of the top. They're the most scariest. These are the proper criminals, the people who really do it. They are so advanced, you need to be scared to sleep because they're going to pwn you just mentioning their names. But the reality is, they seem to copy stuff that we've done or been using for two or three years. So, I don't know. Anyway, this is getting a bit too high level. Okay, the unicorns talk to me. So, Matthew Gerber, does anyone want to shout out his name? I've very likely pronounced it incorrectly. Uh, released... Um, a way of making PowerShell one-liner to bypass antivirus and gain access to machines. Now, the reason why this was fantastic, it was about, we've got a date on here, we're talking three or four years ago, five, no, it's probably about six, six, seven years ago now. And the reason why this was amazing, because at the time, antivirus had no way of looking at memory. It's a RAM, it had no way at all. So if we could run all of our code in RAM, we could do absolutely anything we like, and we did for years. It was amazing. Now, that has come to an end, uh, but his discovery was converted into a tool called Unicorn by David Kennedy uh, and Josh Kelly of TrustedSec, and it's an, you can download it and have a look at it if you want. I love it. It's an amazing tool. So, generating the Unicorn payloads, because I like to do videos. So, let's have a look. This is exactly how you generate a Unicorn payload. So, you go to the GitHub uh, for their site, and you download it, and you move it to the directory. And you simply run it to start with, and it gives you all the examples. Now, you can use Cobalt Strike payloads of it now, and you can make Metasploits, MSF payloads. And if anyone, uh, I will talk about this later, I was about to say, I don't use MSF directly on a red team, but I won't lie to people, I do, do still use it. Once I've got access, I might pivot and use it. But, right, so to create a payload, all you do is you change your IP address, you take the original copy, you change your IP address, and you just hit go. And what it outputs is two files. One of them is a handler for Metasploit, and the other one is your actual one-liner PowerShell. Now, all you need to do is get that one-liner PowerShell onto a box, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But here you go. So it's the PowerShell attack and the Unicorn RC file. The Unicorn RC is the Metasploit handler, and I'll explain that in a minute. And there you go. That's the one-liner. So we copy that, and all you do is start Metasploit, and you reference the handler file, uh, which Unicorn created, and it will automatically load your handler for you. Right, I'll now move over to the target machine. I never like using the term victim. Uh, I just personally think it's a bit disrespectful. They're a target, they're not a victim. Um, so, we're on the target machine, and I'll start up PowerShell, just for the demonstration. And I hit enter. Now that has taken the code, and it will send a reverse connection back to our handler, which will go, let me, you know, control you. And at that point, we have our session. So, shell one is open. We can now remotely control that machine. But, how can you make this look better? Because your likelihood of being able to e email someone a, a one-liner PowerShell and go, please install this or run this, is quite slim. So, what we do is we have one of my YouTube videos, which will probably be banned after this. And we have a, a recruitment page. Now, it all works. It looks semi-legit. You'd obviously have it over HTTPS normally, but I have here an SMB listener, which is Responder, and I also have uh, 
a Metasploit handler. So we're going to the in, we're going to the index file of the web page. We're just browsing it with IE, and you'll see there we've snagged the credential. So I said responder a minute ago. This was actually using the SMB listener built into Metasploit back then when I made this video. I did make this video a few years ago. Right. So we go to a page, and you'll see what they see. This now takes them to a HTA, which is one of the unicorn payloads, and you make a bit of a page that says, allow this, run this, and hope that they will trust it, and they click it. You don't need to click that at the bottom, that's just IE being IE. And there you go, you get your reverse session back to them. So you can now control that machine remotely. So we've got the hash, and we've also got a remote connection in. This is everything I love on a test. Now this is where our story changes a little. Okay, I've always spoken about UNC. Uh, UNC is the actual function. When I talk about SMB, Microsoft actually call it UNC. So it's actually UNC exploitation. UNC is the actual request uh, for SMB. And I mentioned Responder in my talk earlier. If anyone's interested in getting a copy of Responder, Responder does exactly what it says. It listens to a request and it responds to it and says, send me your domain name, your username and your password hash. At that point, the target does. So how can we add UNC? Right, I'm really, really interested in adding SMB to things. So what I wanted to do was have Unicorn and a shell all at the same time. I didn't want to have to do tricky things and get them to click here and do that and that. I just wanted to just trigger a shell and get, get an SMB request at the same time. So here's an extract from the Unicorn PowerShell one-liner. So I did that. Sorry, silence, I was expecting something. I'll make it clearer. So literally, all I did was I dropped in a cheeky SMB request right in the middle. And here's a video of what you get. So there I am just copying the SMB request and just pasting it in between. Uh, it always so slow when you uh, do them at home. It always seems like a good idea. So we paste this on, on, on our target. We start Responder up, and that's, me how, that's how you start Responder up. I've just done it. And you paste that there, and you've got my handler going on Metasploit. So we now paste that into the target machine. And there we go. So we've got our session, and we also got our hashes. Now, that's something I really like to do. I like to combine things. So I like to make it just one click, bang, you've got multiple things. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Right, now, let's make this even better, because I generally like to make things even better. So, mail gateways are getting hard to bypass. I mentioned that earlier. Now, we typically place a dock in a hyperlink, so you have something like this. So instead of having the attachment, you now have a link. And they get this and hopefully they will trigger it. So how can I make this better? Here you go. Send me your creds and your shell in one go. So here I have uh, an index file, which in the web directory you also have the index file and the document you want to serve to them. And then what you have, you have the SMB request in the index, and you also have an iframe which automatically serves that document when they browse it. So when they go to that website, they now get this, the document still automatically, and we also get that. So we get a remote connection, and we get their, their, their credentials, well, their, their hash as well. Okay, some will be thinking, most will be thinking, uh, I've done a lot of sort of talking here about PowerShell, and a lot of people are saying that PowerShell is dead. Just to prove that a lot of people are saying PowerShell is dead, here I was two years ago at B-Size London telling everyone PowerShell is dead. So why bother? Well, it's a good question, but this is the reason why 2019 I'm still talking about PowerShell. Um, if anyone goes on Reddit, and I discussed Reddit last night, I find Reddit scary. It's just the place you go to get abused. But that aside, um, it's good for red teaming tips. And people are continuously talking about ways of bypassing the thing that now stops PowerShell, stops us from running it. And what that is, is an additional layer that Microsoft came up with for Defender and any other antivirus that wants to use it, and it's called AMPSI. And AMPSI is uh, it's the pain of our lives in red teaming. If anything is to stop us from having our fun, it is AMPSI. So how it works is, while we are running rife through your memory of your computers, Microsoft was eventually like, you know what, we need to stop this. But you can't scan memory on a machine easily. If you actually look at Defender, uh, it generally, when it's running, it will use when it's scanning your machine, up to 50% of your CPU, and it uses a lot of memory anyway. So if you were then to tell that to scan your memory, your machine would just halt and crash. It wouldn't necessarily crash, but it would just halt up. And it could halt up for periods of, well, continuous, while it was scanning. 
So what they've come up with, and I can't explain to you the innings and the outing working of ANSI, I'm just not that smart, but they've found a way of, in essence, scanning memory and looking for certain malicious codes like PowerShell, JavaScript. Uh, red teamers are all moving over to C Sharp, and I hate to be the first person to say it, and I don't have a slide yet saying C Sharp is dead, but there is rumours and people are saying that ANSI is going to start spotting C Sharp as well. Now, that bypass, uh, bypasses for AMSI though, by the way, it's worth noting, are quite regular. So like once a month, sometimes even once a week, someone will come up with a new and great way to bypass AMSI. And that one there, which I'm mentioning, is down to Mohammed Danish, who came up with it. And there's a quick screenshot of it, and it's a download cradle. And it's just a way of downloading our simulated malware scripts and running them on a machine that's running Defender and AMSI. And at the period of that release, it did work. Does it work anymore? I don't know. Interestingly, Unicorn, which can help you to bypass uh, AMSI and Defender, bypasses AMSI and Defender with a new update, and sometimes as little as two hours later, it stops working. Because Microsoft is that quick now at changing signatures. Right, that is Defender running in real time with AMSI. So when you go to your Defender settings, if you've got that on, you have got AMSI and you're running it on your machine. Now, let's have another reason why we can still use PowerShell in 2019. That was not long ago, that tweet. Now, clearly you can't run PowerShell on Windows NT, but it proves a good point. People do love to use legacy systems. They don't change. They do keep using old machines. Now, we have this. This made me laugh, and this was not long ago. So, yes, you can use Windows XP forever. So let's look at how we can make this safe. And I, I wanted to read this because it was amusing. Okay, so you in install a dedicated antivirus where well, you can't get Defender on it. Uh, keep your software up to date. Okay. Stop using Internet Explorer. That's a very good tip. Uh, stop using Java. Good tip. Use a day-to-day -day account. I don't actually know what that means. Uh, do you create a domain account? Am I being fixed? Do, do you create a domain account every day for a user who wants to use Windows XP? Just don't use Windows XP. Okay. Use a virtual machine. Well, yes, for lab environments, definitely use a virtual machine. If you're doing anything that you think is slightly suspicious, or you're running anything that's slightly suspicious on it, have no network connectivity to that virtual machine. It's not a bad tip. Choose wisely on what to install on Windows XP. I don't think you can actually install stuff on Windows XP. I could be wrong, but I don't think much would run on it anymore. That bit, number eight, just made me giggle at home. I am already feeling more secure. <laughs> Okay, uh, as I've mentioned with Windows NT, ironically, uh, Windows XP did not come with PowerShell 2, and we use PowerShell version 2 for the majority of our simulated malicious code. So we couldn't run it on this machine. But we've got your back covered, because if you want to install PowerShell 2 on Windows XP, apparently you can, and here's a blog on how to do it. Right, this is a good tweet. Um, yeah, think McFly, think. If you're not using... Uh, AMSI in your AV products. Uh, I'm not going to mention uh, leading AV antivirus products, but they don't stop us. Um, the only one that causes me the most amount of pain is Defender. Now, this is a good point. Uh, this majority here, big chunk, yeah, they're not using AMSI, so we can still attack that easily with PowerShell. And this is quite recent, by the way. I, I think it was about a month back I did it. So this Windows 10, uh, it, it, as a pen tester, it does scare me. I find Windows 10 definitely a harder beast to you know, to attack. But the first thing that most enterprises do is turn Defender off. And so in, in essence, they're turning AMSI off. They replace it with their chosen antivirus. So if you actually look at this big section here, it's 39%, I would suspect probably only that amount has Defender with AMSI running. So in all honesty, you can compromise all of that. So we still have, in 2019, a very large section of machines out there that as long as they're in scope and we're authorised to do, we can attack. So, this is a good point. Uh, 2020, January the 14th, Windows 7, unfortunately, goes end of life. And the reason I say unfortunately, I think it was one of the best operating systems they've ever made. But that's my opinion. But what we're going to see six months after that is this. I'll be talking about this next year. Okay, so PowerShell's still got a bit of time. Okay, so, reminder, I'd mentioned Unicorn. Now, I use Unicorn a lot on engagements, um, but midway through an engagement, when I'm about to attack a target, and I'm richly, and this is worth mentioning, I discussed earlier very badly because I was nervous at that point, but when you are building infrastructure and you're getting ready to attack a target, you just want your tools that you use day in, day out to work, and you automate a lot of it, because we love to automate things. And when suddenly something breaks, and you know that you've got one day, or two days, or three days to prepare, 
and they are expecting a, a, you know, a simulation of an APT group. Uh, you panic. It, it, it is really, really scary. Anyway, rewind for one second. I'd love to jump from one thing to another. Uh, right, so we had advanced adversaries, yes. Clone your work, clone your work. I did originally say, love your work, love your work, but I thought it was a bit... shouldn't probably say that. Right, introducing Cobalt Strike. So, what is Cobalt Strike? I'm not here to sell it. Uh, definitely not here to sell it. Uh, it is a very, very good C2. Now, a lot of you will be thinking, what the hell is a C2? You've just lobbed that in. Right, a C2 was a US military word, and it was a command and control function. Uh, we took it for red teaming. I don't know really why. It's a bit of a cool word. Cool word. Uh, but if anyone's interested in reading about uh, red teaming infrastructure and just general red teaming tips, I think Blue Screen of Jeff is the best blog out there for reading about red teaming. I'll go as far as to say I think it's the red teaming bible. Um, but if you look at here, here's a typical infrastructure. So we have a C2, and this is where our targeted or our compromised targets communicate back to, and we can control them from our C2 and send commands backwards and get responses back to us. Now, in the real world, we have redirectors. Now, these are AWS or DigitalOcean or I'm trying to think. I can never say the Microsoft one. Uh, they are VPSs. They are Dropbox, that are droplets, as they call them. And so the targets, all they ever see is a legitimate domain that we purchased going to a redirector, which is an IP address somewhere on the internet, and you can buy droplets in any country pretty much in the world. So if we were to simulate China or simulate Russia or simulate England, we can do that. And they see that traffic going backwards to that. They never see the IP address of our C2 where we actually control them from. So if we were to be burnt on a red team, and you do get this on a red team, they go, ha ha, spotted you. I don't care. Because in all honesty, it's an attack. And all we're going to do is we're going to just burn that redirector and five minutes later we've got a new IP address from a new country, we've got a completely new domain, we are good to go. And what they generally don't realise is we've had multiple connections to multiple C2s. So in all honesty, if one gets burnt, it's really not a problem. Okay, I was talking about Cobalt Strike. A lot of red teamers use Cobalt Strike, which is why I did bring it up. Uh, it's an amazing C2, or very good C2, but the payload creation, which is fantastic built into it, the option to create payloads is incredible, but it gets caught by antivirus. So a quick primer on antivirus. Signature, signature, signature. So how can you use Cobalt Strike, uh, your C Cobalt Strike and your C2 to bypass antivirus? This is the third party solutions. Now I use Unicorn mostly, but MDSec Sharpshooter is very, very good. And Dom uh, of MDSec released a video of Hack Paris, uh, I think about a month back, and it's definitely worth watching and hunting out because he literally just explains how they do a red teaming and he talks about sharpshooter inside and out, very, very openly talks about it. And it was a very, very interesting video. It's a very brave video to do. So the cool people said, try Cobalt Strike, it'll be fun. So I did. And I was pwning lots of targets over and over and over until Unicorn version 3.2.6. Unicorn broke. So why did it break? And here's a video. So we have the cat and mouse. I'm going to have to watch this video. Where does the cat go to? Anyway, back, back to the thing. Right, cat and mouse games. So, why is there a signature for Unicorn? Well, uh, there's a signature for any third-party solution that will help uh, obfuscate your payloads because they're popular and they're used. So, I also have another reason. If anyone's ever opened the Unicorn Python script up, and actually read the comments that Dave Kennedy has written. They're amazing. I'm just going to read this out for anyone who can't see it right at the back. Sorry for the rant, but it's anno annoying to have to sit here and rewrite stupid stuff because you wrote a crum crummy signature. Love, Dave. Now, it, it doesn't say love, Dave, but I think you should have signed it off, love, Dave. So, what broke? So, I'm trying to create my payload and uh, use a Cobalt Strike and Unicorn, and that's the command you do to do that. So, you just reference your Cobalt Strike uh, C sharp code and you tell it to output as a macro because I love using macros and it said this now it always worked historically never had a problem and then bang when I really really needed it on a really really important engagement I got too many line continuations so panic as I mentioned it's very scary on a red team when it goes wrong so I googled too many line continuations because I didn't actually know what it meant and it said your code has got more how dare your code but your VBS code has more than 25 physical lines joined with line continuation characters. So a quick primer, because I mentioned the word macros. Uh, a macro 
uh, is uh, in Office, you can automat automate frequently used tasks by creating and running macros. These are commands that you can group together. I love grouping stuff together and having it do multiple things uh, to accomplish a task automatically. Macros can be used to run remote shells or malicious code. Office comes with VBA. And here we go to show you uh, an extract from it. And here's your line continuations. And what that is, it's all one line, but that and that tells the computer to make it one line or to work out that that is all one line. It needs to run it. Now, so what I tried to do, knowing I couldn't have any more than 25 lines down, I thought I'd have a little bash for myself. And all I need to do is make them really, really long. So I deleted a lot of the line continuations. And I ended up with like 30 odd lines down to this. And I thought, this is going to work. Woohoo. Anyway, it didn't because they saw me coming. So not only can you have no more than that, you can have no more than that. So it is actually quite restrictive in VBA, which is something that I learned. By the way, this might be a very good time to introduce myself. My name's Neil Lyons, and I work for Pentest Partners. So, if you've been to anything that I've presented before, you'll know that I like to mess with things. I'm a lover of functionality. Microsoft Office gives you so much. Uh, VB macros offer you great functionality. VB macros are really hard to write uh, unless you're a coder. Now, I will be the very first person to say I am far from a coder. I am absolutely no coder at all. It's scary. I, I just don't understand it, really. But I have a little go with it. Uh, and why, well, well, that's cool, but why is it cool? Because we are hackers. Uh, and historically, hackers didn't have a clue what they were doing. They would just take something and have a little play with it and get it to do something else. And in reality, that is what hacking really is today. Okay, scene five. This is the end. So, how do I wrap this up? Okay, so the week Unicorn was broke, I got busy. I started thinking, is Shell the only way? Do we need full remote access? What else can a macro do? I started looking at VBA. It was confusing. A quick insight into how I think. Uh, could I just put a PowerShell command directly into VBA without tweaking it whatsoever? And the answer is yes and no. Uh, what I discovered was, if you do very, very simple stuff, like in VBA, you just literally drop in dir, PowerShell dir, or PowerShell IP config, uh, it works. It will give you the results. So I was like, oh, this is easy. I can wing this. So I went from that to uh, instantly going, because this is how my brain works. Right, can I now do Kerber roasting just like from that to that? Now, if anyone doesn't know what Kerber roasting is, any standard user on a Microsoft domain has the right to request the uh, copy of the username and the password hashes and the domain name for your service accounts on your DC that are flying across your network doing service account things. Now, service accounts are generally, not generally, service accounts historically have often been part of the domain administrative group. So any standard user by default can, in, in essence, ask for a copy of your domain administrative uh, assigned account, which is quite scary. And there you go. This is the PowerShell one line that allows you to do that. So if you were to just copy and paste that into any domain joined machine, uh, nine times out of ten, it will just output you a list of service accounts and their password hash, which you can then go off and reverse. But if you were to just drop that into VBA, and try and convert it into a, well, to make it as a macro, hell no, that is just not going to work. You very, very quickly just have a sea of red and pain, and this just isn't going to work. So I, I learned quite quickly it's not easy to run very complex commands. So I googled it, and this took me, to give you an idea, I'll be, I'll be very honest, it took me probably about three days to figure out uh, from messing around in my lab. I don't do things quickly. I'm not one of the people. I don't think a lot of people, you see people on YouTube, people we look up to and respect, you see them on YouTube on the video, and within seconds, they've just done something really complex and really incredible. I don't think most people are like that in the real world. I think we do take time doing things. Anyway, this is the answer. You had to unicode, you had to base encode it, base64. So I encoded the command, and I did that all by hand. Uh, and I, I didn't encode it by hand, but I found a way to encode it, and I created the script by hand. And it was really, really, really painful. But I ran it, and it worked. But it did take me far too long. So I got the Kerberos request and outputted the service accounts. So I was like, that's fantastic. How can I now make this better? So obviously you wanted to email you the results, because that would be quite a logical solution, in my head anyway. So this is what I came up with. So we had the Kerberos request, and once it's completed that, it outputs the hash files, which does drop to disk, I apologise. Uh, and, and at some point, if I can ever be bothered, because I'm kind of fed up of doing this, but if I can ever be bothered, I might actually get it to all runs in memory so it doesn't actually drop anything to disk, because I know it's possible. But once it's completed with that, on the target machine, and this is the bit that I love, it then spins up uh, an SMTP service, and it emails it to your defined Gmail accounts, because this is set up here for Gmail. 
So, and then afterwards, it shuts it all down and it deletes your file. So, nice, but it was very painful to manually make the macro. So I googled it, and there's quite a few examples how to make PowerShell to VBA, and there's lots of scripts out there, and I, I tried them, but they just didn't really work or do what I wanted. They just, they, no one seems to make a script for the way I think. So I bashed my own up. Now, yes, I could have written this in Python. I could have gone away and spent another month or two figuring out how to write it in Python. But I thought, why, why bother? I'm doing this in my own time, for my own amusement. I might as well choose bash. I don't want to pretend I'm Lee. So here we go. This is what I've come up with. So that there you can bump up to, I think, 190. And what that is, is that is the amount of lines, uh, the amount of code you're going to allow on each line. I discovered the limit seems to be around about 195 characters before it says, no, it's too long. And in essence, what the rest of it does is it makes PowerShell Cradle, and it sticks all together. Do you know what? I'm not going to talk about it. I have a video. So this is my uh, exploit, my uh, GitHub, which absolutely no one follows, uh, which I quite like, because for years I've been using it for cheeky things, and no one spotted what I've been up to. So here we go. I have cloned it, and I'm about to run it. So all it, all it asks you for is the file that you want to uh, turn, turn, like change into a VBA. Now, at this point, I'm just going to pump it up to 190 characters. And literally all it does, yeah, it asks you if you, you make your PowerShell one line, and then you just save it as a notepad file, and you just reference it. And wait for it. Come on, hurry up. Uh, and it just outputs the VBA code for you. <coughs> Boom, done. So, now what you would do is you just drop that into your target machine. Now, for this example, I'll use Microsoft Word, clearly, um, and uh, you'll see the results. Now, I hope that I do it in this. I get asked a lot uh, on YouTube. Like, people will say to me, it doesn't work. I don't have the developer tab in Microsoft Office. It's probably my number one thing that people abuse me about. Uh, you have to enable it in Microsoft Office. I'm hoping this video is not enabled so I can talk people through it. I can't remember. I make these videos sometimes months back and don't remember. Yeah, here we go. So, to, to turn on developer, which allows you access to the VBA section of Word, you just tick the box. And then you have a developer tab, which you can now go to create a new macro. So, import module, paste it in. Now, for this video, I'm just going to hit run just to verify that it works. This is what I'll be doing at home. And I'm sitting, and there you go, bang. So I've now sent from a targeted machine, uh, I've proven that it is possible from one click to get that target machine to make a request to the domain controller, ask for a copy of the service accounts, and send you uh, a copy of the service accounts, which very likely belong to the domain administrative group, uh, across the internet, it's encrypted, uh, to your Gmail account. So in theory, you could weaponize this and now turn it into a legitimate object that you're going to send to someone. And you could, in theory, compromise them quite badly or quite painfully. If you were told that someone managed to get your domain administrative account uh, in an email sent to them just from one person clicking an email or clicking a Word document, uh, I'd, I'd be quite concerned. Now, would I use this on an engagement? No. Um, uh, I don't know. Maybe one day I might use something like it. I definitely wouldn't use this. Uh, it's not late and it's not stealthy, um, but it's something that I like to do in a lab. So, uh, if anyone went to the Chris's workshop yesterday about WMI, he said something that resonated with me. Um, he said, uh, some people like to do hello world in, when practicing writing code. I don't. I like to create a rat. And the, 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 what, what it sort of said to me is, in our labs, in our own time, do whatever the hell you like. Come up with stuff that you think is fun and funky. Right, scene six. The start. Okay, so I had an idea. I'm at a point where I'm quite excited by this. Okay, so we can capture people who belong to the domain administrative group. That's yes. So, can we capture a DA hashes, enumerate all machines, user groups, why stop there? Can we also locate all admin users, all shares, find out if we have local administrative rights, see if there's any clear text credentials flying around there? Can we also grab interesting files? Can we automatically get that email back to us? Can we do the whole lot? Do everything just from one click? Okay, so I came up with this. So I'm just adding more and more one-liners. You can see, yeah, there you go, find local administrative touches. This one's incredible. Find user field. Um, I didn't know about this until I actually started labbing it. Uh, on, on the DC, uh, it seems that administrators, quite commonly, in the user field group, so when you click on the user, you, you've got the tabs at the top when you're on uh, uh, domain, when you're... Uh, I'm forgetting what I'm saying. Active Directory. Sorry. When you're in Active Directory and you go to Users, you have a tab called User Field, and people write notes about that account. But it seems that what is quite common, people add passwords into that User Field. So I don't know why they do it, but they do it. And I've tried it on internals, and actually it's true. They do do it. 
So it's quite an interesting way of getting clear text uh, passwords. Anyway, so here we go. So I'm on a target machine and I open the Word documents. And I hit enable content and boom, it's done. And then we just wait. And there we go, we got it. So, we have the Kerberos hashes, we have a domain administrator of the group. And we also have their clear text password from a user field that someone's added. Now this is my lab, <laughs> worth knowing. Uh, and then we have enumeration about machines and SMB stuff and blah, 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 and you have whatever you like. So, a lot of you will be thinking, well, that's Windows 7. And this is where the whole AMPSI thing comes in, and a lot of people will be going, well, it's not going to bypass AMPSI, so you're an amateur. But remembering, almost all of that doesn't have AMPSI, so that could be affected by something like that. But anyway, just because I like to make things cooler, let's bypass AMPSI. Now, this is work in progress. So this is going against Windows 10, Defender's on, AMPSI's running, and boom. And something I've noticed about Windows 10, this works a damn sight quicker. Don't know why, bang, we got it. Now, that's work in progress, but I do tend to, you'll probably get a feel from the style of talking, I jump from things to things. Uh, I don't know if I'll continue with this project, I don't know. Right, I'm MyExploit2600 on Twitter, thank you very much. <laughs>